Welcome to this uh, conversation hosted by Emerald Technology Ventures. In this episode today, we will talk about SPACs and the increased interest in climate tech. My guest here today is Damien Sauer of Namura Green Tech. My name is Hans Stellenbach. So let's dive into this topic. Damien, uh, I just heard you talk at the European Venture Fair about SPACs, but let's first dive into the topic of increased uh, interest in climate tech. A lot has been said about um, climate tech and we have been around for 20 years seeing an increase and then a deflation in interest. How do you explain the renewed interest in this topic? I would say that, uh, you know, what happened uh, since the, the beginning of the, of the pandemic uh, uh, helped also uh, investors uh, to uh, notice that obviously the performance of uh, companies uh, which have uh, um, uh, an angle around, um, you know, uh, uh, ESG uh, has been much better than the others. I mean, uh, if you look at the performance of the uh, Green Edge Clean Energy Index over the last 24 months, it outperformed the S&P 500 by almost three and a half times. If you look at the uh, amount of money that has been raised uh, through ESG SPACs, we are talking about more than $230 billion. So obviously there is a massive appetite for this type of companies simply because people notice that a lot of them are performing well. Obviously, I'm sure that we're going to talk about that. There was some exuberance in the market. There is a need now to really make sure that, you know, the right companies go public. But um, this is clearly an area where you see a lot of appetite. And here we are talking about public transactions. But on the private side, it's exactly the same thing. We see a lot of big groups, uh, big industrial groups, uh, big energy groups uh, being quite active on the m and side in order to muscle their alternative energy divisions. We see a lot of nice private placement transaction getting done. So the money is there and the money is often going for companies basically, which uh, can really make a difference and with a viable sustainable model. Okay, in our, in our sector, we see, I think 2021, more investment than all of 2020. And I'm wondering whether this increased amount of capital helps increase the valuations um, or inflates the valuations, or if it actually helps to innovate faster as well. What's your view there? I think that, um, you know, one of the problems that uh, we are facing is that uh, a lot of the pockets of capital are chasing the same thing. Uh, the same segments, um, the same profiles of companies. So when you manage to go in the market with, with companies with large addressable markets, commercial traction, technologies, which are largely de-risked, and when these companies have very good management and touch basically uh, the, the ESG, uh, ESG topic, most of the time you have very competitive process and therefore, basically, it's really driving the valuation up. Whether you go for, uh, you know, a, a private deal or whether you go for a SPAC deal, even though, once again, uh, it's important uh, to make sure that the companies are well prepared for such type of transactions before going public. When the problem comes is um, when, in fact, uh, uh, you don't match these criteria. Because when you don't match these criteria, it is sometimes it's still more difficult basically to find the money except for some sectors where we see uh, a kind of uh, big uh, appetite uh, around basically the, the uh, potential disruptive technologies. So kind of a, a herd mentality. Exactly. Does yeah. that then mean the other way around that there would be, in your view, underinvested sectors or under detected sectors as well? I mean, by definition, yes, and it's our job to mm -hmm. identify them. And uh, because I think that where we can really make a difference is by uh, foreseeing the future, by really anticipating where the big things are coming from and, uh, and building relationship with these companies quite early. Mm -hmm. What we see as well is that there are certain regions or countries 
where we see inflated valuations. I'm talking about regions such as Israel or maybe California. And we also see other countries, maybe in the Nordics, where this is less the case, maybe even Switzerland to some extent, actually. Yeah. I think that, you know, it's interesting what you're saying, Hans, because it comes a lot uh, to the point which is, as a manager, as a management team, uh, how can you make sure that you put your company on the radar of the investors? Mm -hmm. And I have to say that indeed, uh, on the two geographies you mentioned, whether it's Israel or uh, uh, basically California, a lot of times companies are doing a pretty good job. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that here we are talking about a cultural point. That being said, if I look at the Nordics, for example, um, it might be more difficult for companies to be known, uh, even though I have in fact a counter example. We just did a deal for a company called Cognite, which is based in Norway, fantastic company incubated by uh, by Acker and uh, we raise money from them for them from investors in the US and now it's a company which is very well known so you you can still find businesses even in these areas which are basically marketing them properly and when you don't it's important to have a strong local market and in in for example in the Nordics you have some strong regional IPO markets which defends pretty good valuations okay where do you see the roles of the corporates in this private segment of the of the ESG market? Since we we, we started, you know, green tech now uh, Nomura Green Tech, uh, we uh, really had the uh, the conviction that it's not one against the other, meaning it's not disruptive companies against large corporates. The job is really to build a bridge between both. I think that the job of the large corporates today is really to deploy technologies when they feel that they are the right ones, to give access to their customers, to give access also to their capabilities, because let's not, let's also be realistic. I mean, a lot of the companies, for example, I'm thinking about the oil and gas sectors, a lot of these companies have fantastic capabilities around complex engineering, for example, that can really accelerate the transition. Mm -hmm. So they can bring operational capabilities, they can bring money, they can bring visibility, they can bring capabilities also around complex project financing, which are needed for sectors like offshore, wind, hydrogen. So there is a lot mm -hmm. that can be done here. Okay, but they don't necessarily need to be an investor, shareholder, an equity holder in those startup companies? In no, not always, uh, not always. I think that it can start by a commercial partnership. It can start also by investing in some projects. It can, of course, go to an M&A transaction. But I think the dialogue needs to be much broader than being limited at the VC arm of these large corporates. It has to be on the radar of the CEO of these companies for things to really happen. Because unfortunately, a lot of time we have seen deals where you have the, uh, the VC arms of large corporates investing in companies and under and delivering in terms of operational synergies. And most of the reason behind that is simply the fact that uh, sometimes for these uh, uh, VC teams within large corporates, it's very difficult to put their whole organization uh, in, into motion in order to really be able to deliver these synergies. If it comes from the, the CEO, it's a different story. Okay, let's quickly move to SPACs. You mentioned before that uh, the, the world has gone through maybe a bit of an exuberance in the last couple of years and uh, it's, it's more um, maybe challenging on the one hand, but also more um, normal now uh, to go through a SPAC. And you said that the future uh, will mean that companies will have to bring more quality and better financials. Mm -hmm. What do you mean with that uh, in terms of quality? How would you describe a good quality uh, SPAC candidate? I think that's a SPAC a candidate which uh, can uh, have a, a total addressable market which is large enough. That's the first point. I mean, it's very difficult to go for a, a SPAC when, when uh, your potential for growth is in fact uh, quite limited. The second point is that it needs to be a differentiating business model. It seems obvious, but we have seen in the past uh, some companies going for a SPAC 
So, and then, uh, you know, when you try to really explain the difference between what this company was doing and its competitor, it was a bit difficult basically to convey the message. So clearly a differentiating business model. The third point is that you need basically to have a technology which is very largely proven. I mean, doing a SPAC uh, merger is not about basically doing a VC investment. So that is a point that, that needs to be behind you. You, you might need uh, to have more uh, investments to go into your technology, but the risk around the technology needs to be totally controlled. Um, the other point that I would make is that uh, you need to have commercial traction. I mean, a good way to get a, a public transaction done, you know, a SPAC in that respect is not that different than an IPO, is basically to uh, under-promise and over-deliver. I was going to ask you about, since you mentioned the, the IPO, what you're telling me is what an investment banker would have told me 15 or 20 years ago about an IPO. So where is the difference today between an IPO and a SPAC? The difference is a difference in terms of process and a difference also, and I will tell you the benefits of the SPAC process to some respect. And also the difference comes from the, the, the way you, you value businesses, uh, SPAC merger candidates. Um, so the first point is that in terms of uh, process, a SPAC process, it's a process basically which take uh, less time than an IPO. Um, the second difference is that you have a, 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 market, a price discovery process which is more confidential mm -hmm. and which comes basically earlier. And so that's obviously something which uh, gives more comfort to a lot of SPAC candidates. And the third point is that uh, this is uh, tailored for companies where you're comfortable with the business to the model today, you're comfortable with basically the business plan of the company, and therefore you can value the business really on uh, forward-looking metrics. On 2024, 2025 revenue multiples. It's a bit more difficult to get that done in a traditional okay. IPO process. Thanks very much, Tamia. Let me just ask you one final question. If you were to give a recommendation to an investor, uh, what is going to be hot in the next 10 years, say 2030, what would you recommend? Be it a business model or a sector? Um, that's a very good question. I would say that um, the first thing to look at is really industrial efficiency and and the way basically machine learning and artificial intelligence is transforming the whole sector, the whole industrial sector. That's point number one. Um, and obviously that trend is touching also uh, uh, many other uh, verticals, uh, like for example around uh, grid efficiency, building efficiency, but, but the, the AI and machine learning technologies starting to be bundled basically with technologies touching the overall climatic theme is absolutely fundamental. And uh, broadly speaking, each time you are at the boundary between digitalization and ESG, uh, you're touching technologies which uh, have a, a, a great future in front of them. The two other, I would say, markets that we are watching uh, very closely are uh, the, obviously the hydrogen market. I mean, that's a, a very interesting market, even if today, of course, the applications are not uh, yet clear. It's not the solution for everything. But if you think about the driver of that market, it's a fantastic opportunity for a lot of industrial players who were struggling to get into this whole energy transition theme, to jump into the swimming pool and to play a role. And that's a natural incentive. So things will happen. And the third point is really around um, and, and, uh, the, the whole uh, alternative protein market, where we think that um, there are a lot of changes happening now. It's a massive market and uh, it could uh, very well uh, have a massive impact uh, in the coming years and attract a lot of money. Okay, thank you very much for the conversation, Damien. Thank you very much, Hans. Thank you.